Uh, thanks for the introduction, Peter, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you also to ABEARS for the opportunity to uh, talk with you this afternoon. Um, before I start, I just wanted to uh, get a feel uh, amongst our audience. How, how many people in the room would consider themselves to be ecologists? We've got about four or five. Okay, well, I'm on slightly, or maybe six or seven. I'm on slightly shaky ground then. So ABEARS asked me to talk about the ecological outcomes uh, from the Basin Plan. And as you heard in, my introduc in the introduction Peter gave, I'm a hydrologist. So you're getting a hydrologist perspective here. So that's um, slightly dangerous. Um, so we'll see where that takes us. Um, I was asked to uh, talk to three questions, and, and those are the questions here. What are the expected ecological outcomes of the Basin Plan? Firstly, what are the key implementation challenges in achieving those? And Ron has touched on a perspective on implementation activities, and I'll give you a view of how I see the challenges. And thirdly, what steps are required to maximise potential ecological benefits? Um, as you can tell from the picture here, we're, sh we're, we're straying off into the space here of uh, both known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, so this is a, there's a little bit of speculation and arm wavy here. Um, the, the, the other thing, I don't like starting with apologies, but I do feel I need an apology. From here on in, there's a lot of words, which is, they're really prompts for me to talk to, so you can sort of ignore the screen. It's good that the screen is large, because I'm starting to lose my eyesight, so instead of having to read this screen, I can read the big screen. But I struggle to find good pictures to illustrate uh, what I'll talk to today. So firstly, uh, expected ecological outcome. So, uh, when I start to think about this, I think the ecological outcomes are primarily going to depend on the patterns of water flow, the quantity and the quality uh, that occur over the coming years through the rivers, wetlands and floodplains across the basin. Um, um, but it's not solely on the patterns of water flow. There's a long-term ecological memory from the, from the recent and very severe drought. Uh, so the current starting condition ecologically will have a significant influence on what we see going forward as well. And you'll see that particularly in the longer lived species of the structural things of floodplain vegetation. Uh, and secondly, but also very importantly, it's not just about water flow. Uh, there's a whole lot of other things that are going to determine these ecological outcomes as well. Land management, spe spe specifically riparian management, um, but other aspects of land management, invasive species, diseases among species, fishing pressure, pollution, dams and weirs, and some of the infrastructure. So a complex picture, but in the context of the basin plan, I'll focus mainly on the, you know, the, the, the water side of things, and particularly water quantity. So moving on, uh, what's going to determine the patterns of water flow? Well, firstly, of course, the climate. How much is it going to rain and how hot is it going to be? That's going to determine how much water we get coming into the system. It's going to determine the inflows into our dams. It's going to determine the recharge into our groundwater systems. Do we know how much water, what the rain's going to be in the next uh, few years? No, we don't. We've got some reasonable skill at forecasting now uh, weeks and months and maybe out to seasonal we can forecast uh, inflows. Uh, beyond that, we're really looking at the statistical variability uh, of past uh, climate and hydrology, uh, and perhaps with some added views about what we think climate change may mean to that statistical patterns of variability. So that's the first thing that's going to determine how much, what the water regime looks like. The second is how we share those inflows um, between consumptive use in the environment. And thirdly then, how the available uh, environmental water gets used. Those are the, you know, the key factors in terms of the flow regimes that will lead to ecological outcomes. Uh, as Rhonda alluded to, prior to 2019, when new water sharing plans um, will need to comply with the SDLs in the Basin Plan, current sets of water sharing is determined by the existing set of plans. Uh, however, we, we are moving and increasing the uh, portfolio of held environmental water. So the entitlements that, that are there as entitlement-based water under the water sharing plans, there is a shift still going on between how much is being used for consumptive purposes and how much is being moved into a, a portfolio of held water entitlements, as well as the planned environmental water that's uh, specified under those plans. So all those three factors are determining how much water there'll be in the system and how it can be managed for environmental outcomes. So the third part of this. So we've got this high uncertainty uh, in terms of what these patterns of water are going to be, given the variability of uh, climate and, and flow regimes. Um, but given the current environmental water holdings and given those uh, plans that are in place, what, what might we expect? Well, I've run a couple of sort of um, thought experiments, if you like, 
if we experience a series of wetter than average years, what might we be able to do under these current sets of you know, uh, rules and plans? Well, we may be able to reinstate a whole series of the, the small to medium overbank flow events, which is a, a large part of the flow regime that has been lost through regulation and, and water allocation. What can we do by putting those events back in the system? Uh, well, for the floodplain systems and the long-lived vegetation, that'll lead to uh, improvements in the health and condition of those. It provides recruitment opportunities for germination of new uh, species into those vegetation communities. It'll increase the diversity of floodplain habitats, particularly the hydrological diversity uh, in the depth, duration and the frequency of un, uh, inundation and create more of a mosaic of different hydrologic habitats in the floodplain. It'll improve the connectivity between different habitats, between on the floodplain and from the floodplain back into the channel, and that'll allow the support of a much more diverse uh, range of species, improving system resilience and reducing uh, the ability of invasive uh, species to dominate. On the other hand, if we experience a series of drier than average years, what are those, the arrangements we have in place allow us to do? We should be able to better uh, manage uh, and mitigate against algal blooms and some of the acidity problems we've experienced through the drought because we've got more held environmental water, including, importantly, some high security water. We should be able to better manage the water levels in the lower lakes, better manage the connectivity with the Coorong from the lakes and through the mouth during those dry periods. And so we should be able to avoid the worst of the ecological consequences that we experienced through the uh, driest period and record in the recent drought. Some caveats and risks around that, though. Uh, a couple of things. In the southern basin, as you'll see from the left-hand graph at the bottom, there is a strong seasonal inversion of the flow regime. And under the basin planning and current water sharing arrangements, there's no means to try and reinstate some of the more natural seasonal patterns of flow. We are dealing with the higher and lower flows, but we're not doing anything to address that seasonal inversion, which is strongly tied to the, uh, the demands of irrigation delivery. So that's, that's a part that in this process has been sort of put in the too hard basket. Of course, that pattern of seasonal inversion has been there for a long time now, many uh, decades. So the ecology we see in the system has in some ways become attuned to it, uh, but in terms of reverting to a more natural system, that's a part of the flow regime that is not being dealt with. Um, I'll keep pushing that arrow. I know there's a second dot point. The second one is around the climate change picture, which is in the right-hand graph there. There is strong evidence of a warming and drying trend in the climate, particularly the southern basin, uh, and, but no evidence of reduced variability. So there is a risk that droughts into the future will be more severe into the past. And so while there are things uh, in the plan that help us manage through droughts by having some more environmental water to manage in those dry periods and more security to some of that water, we may well experience some uh, flow conditions and dry periods that we haven't experienced before and there's therefore some risk and uncertainty about how we'll uh, be able to manage our way through that. So that was question one. Moving along to question two, what do I see as the key implementation challenges? Firstly, in the short term. A lot of, um, so I see in the short term that, that one of the biggest challenges is around the effective and efficient use of our environmental uh, water holdings. We've got limited experience in doing this. As Rhonda said, it's a fairly new thing, unlike our long experience with irrigation water management. We have limited predictive uh, ecological capacity to tell us what's going to happen when we undertake various actions. Um, and so to deal with this, there are a few things that I believe are important. Coordination and collaboration between the Commonwealth and states. There are water holdings at different levels of government. Um, and I don't think um, there'll be too many people that would disagree with me that I don't think we're improving our collaboration between those levels of government through this process. If anything, I think we're in a worse position than we were some years ago. So that presents an implementation challenge. Uh, additionally, the interface and collaboration between water managers not water managements, water managers and research institutions will be important because of this uh, limited knowledge base to drive this, the need to invest there and to work collaboratively together uh, in how we implement our environmental water. Secondly, uh, and Rhonda touched, spent a bit of time talking about this, looking at the opportunities to relax or remove the constraints, both the physical constraints uh, but also the rules-based constraints in terms of the definitions of entitlements, carryover rules and how we manage water, which are state, generally state-based rules. We need to explore the changes to those carryover rules, particularly for held water environment, uh, environmental water. 
we need to explore changes to dam operating strategies that rebalance the risks and benefits amongst consumptive users, environments and flooding risk. There are ups and downs to all of these and our uh, operating strategies have been formulated for one set of uh, arrangements of outcomes and we need to, uh, I think, revisit those. Uh, scenario modelling, I believe, is a key tool to help us explore the range of consequences of different uh, strategies there, both with, uh, in those ex constraints and dam operating um, rules. Uh, an appropriate risk framework for guiding watering, uh, watering decisions, I think, is important. I'm not sure that we've got to that yet. Uh, given the uncertainties around this and the multiple outcomes, both the anticipated and unexpected, I think we need to couch this strongly in a risk framework. Uh, that everybody understands and is collectively working to. And we need effective engagement with local communities and authorities that improve those watering outcomes. A lot of the knowledge at, at a local level that will lead to good outcomes is held uh, more locally and then is not held by you know, central government agencies. Looking to the longer term for those implementation challenges, I believe it's really about taking adaptive management seriously. Adaptive management is spoken to in the instrument, in the legislative instrument, as uh, being a key part of the implementation. Um, it's, easy, it's something that's easy to say, it's harder to do of course. To do this I think we need to invest smartly and by smartly I mean informed by knowledge, evidence based uh, investments and strategically in environmental monitoring in order to assess the outcomes of watering. Monitoring is expensive business, you could easily go and spend it millions and in fact billions of money, dollars collecting information. So we need to monitor but we need to do it smartly and strategically, not just uh, a shotgun approach. We need to have in place the arrangements to be able to analyse those monitoring results that build the knowledge base and our understanding around ecological responses and thus increase our predictive capability so that we're learning each stage about what's going to happen as a result of watering events. That allows us to re refine our intervention actions and strategies. I, uh, I think it's important also to recognise that the learning that comes out of an adaptive process is not just a scientific uh, issue, it is important in the science of building that knowledge, but it's around operational management, the, the operational side of environmental water managers and just dam operations and learning from a, a different way of doing business. And it's about institutional learning and uh, building different types of relationships. So it happens at multiple levels. Um, Rhonda touched on the SDL adjustment process, I think one of the uh, longer term uh, or medium term perhaps implementation challenges is getting a gr stronger agreement on the focus and direction for an SDL adjustment process. Uh, what's there in the instrument uh, is, uh, allows for two directions of movement to support uh, a Victorian view and a South Australian view and they're sort of pulling this in two different directions and uh, it's there as a, in my view as a compromise and I think we need, we'll, there'll need to be some collaboration to work out where is this sensibly going for the best uh, balanced set of uh, multiple outcomes. So the last question, steps to maximise ecological benefits and clearly some of these follow on from the in implementation challenges and so I've divided this into short term and long term again. I think uh, where we need to focus to maximise these benefits certainly in the short term is on the coordinated, efficient and effective management of the environmental water or holdings we have in synergy with the management of the planned environmental water that's uh, protected or articulated under water sharing plans. To do this, what do we need to do? We need to establish, as I said, this risk framework for managing environmental water in the context of both the desired positive outcomes, but importantly also the negative potential outcomes. I think in many ways we need to manage our portfolio of water to make sure we avoid the undesired outcomes or consequences and not be too focused on optimising the good outcomes, but making sure that we allow the system to uh, evolve itself while managing away from um, undesired states. We need to articulate both short-term watering strategies and plans uh, within this, fr uh, this risk framework at multiple levels, at the basin, region and down to catchment levels, so there's clarity amongst the different players and water managers about what the um, objectives and strategies are that we're implementing in the short term. And I believe we need improved processes and forums for the interactions and knowledge exchange that I spoke about between water managers, infrastructure operators, the science community and relevant community groups. That's required to underpin the learning process. Investment, and this sound was, uh, is of course a direct pitch now from my own business perspective, but I do believe that investment in targeted and collaborative R&D that levers off the monitoring work 
to build the knowledge base is going to be critical if we're going to maximise the outcomes. We don't have the knowledge base now. We're flying blind a little bit. We've done a lot of work to secure water and we don't have a good knowledge base to tell us how to use it. If we had that amount of water going to an irrigation business with the knowledge base we have around environmental things, I think people would be pretty worried. I know that Laurie would be worried. <laughs> um, so number two, in the longer term, what do we need to do? Um, so we've talked about this, the smart and strategic investments in environmental monitoring that drive the adaptive management. Um, I think there's opportunities for the development and application of new monitoring technologies. We, this is what I mean about doing it smarter. It's not just about going out day after day in the field and reading a stick in the water or counting bugs. We need a much more use of modern technologies, remote sensing, sensor networks uh, that are uh, cost effective, can be broadly deployed and are giving us better real time information about environmental situation awareness. So we know what's out there and we can have a decision supporting systems that uh, target our watering actions. Um, we do need to find a way as we improve our hydrological forecasts and stream flow forecasts and as those go further out to couple those into our environmental watering that inform our risk decisions. We need to move to more, uh, this comes back to a point I made at the beginning, move to more integrated environmental management. Although this is a very water focused thing, we do need to find the ways that this becomes more integrated with other NRM activities and actions, including catchment and riparian management and planning and the match management of pests and invasive species. We need to look at the infrastructure options. So there, is, there are the opportunities for, for engineering uh, uh, solutions or uh, investments to maximise ecological benefits. Uh, that improve the scope of our ability to manipulate flow events. It is a managed system, but it's designed for managing for irrigation supply, and I think there'll be opportunities to say, what is the infrastructure we need to better give the uh, facility to manage environmental watering? We need to increase the efficiency and control of that, and that often will require infrastructure. And we need to look at ways that reduce the ecological impact of the current structures, weirs, dams, other uh, things on the floodplain, uh, to maximise those uh, ecological benefits. So, way ahead of time, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick, a quick recap on these. F climate variability and, and change, climate change, means that the actual flows we're going to get in the next decade or so are, are largely sort of unknowable, except in a statistical sense. So the ecological outcomes can't be pre predicted precisely, but we can predict the types of outcomes we'd expect under the different uh, climatic regimes we may experience and talk about the trend and condition relative to pre plan conditions. Um, prior to SDL compliance, after the new generation of plans in 2019, the outcomes are going to depend primarily on the judicious management of current environmental water, both planned and held. Uh, and the longer term success is going to depend on taking ad adaptive management seriously, including strategic investments into the monitoring side of this, linking that into research and investigations to build our knowledge base, and building the stronger and longer term collaborative partnerships across multiple levels of government the research community and the broader community. Oh, we're going backwards. Rewind, that's a good way to use up time. So overall, um, I think the goal here is for a more resilient, but I think almost more than more resilient, uh, a term that's popped up recently around an anti-fragile system, and that's one that gets stronger because of perturbations. So as we perturb the system into extremes, if we've got the infrastructure, including planning and institutions around that enable us to learn from that, that the collected system actually gets stronger as a result of the perturbation. It's not just resilient, it's strengthening itself, and hence I think this goal is for what I call an anti-fragile socio-ecological system for the Murray-Darling Basin. And it's not just an uh, institutional one, it's that social and ecological and institutional uh, collaboration. Thank you. Are there questions for...